<laughs> Good afternoon. I wanted to make sure everyone was awake. <laughs> Good afternoon, Commerce and Labor Committee. Welcome to our Friday edition of Commerce and Labor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Assemblywoman Carlton. Assemblywoman Considine. Assemblywoman Dickman. Assemblywoman Duran. Assemblyman Flores. Assemblyman Frierson. Assemblywoman Hardy. Assemblywoman Kasama. Assemblywoman Martinez. Assemblywoman Marzola. Assemblyman O'Neill. Assemblywoman Tolls. Chair Howdigy. Here. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary. Please note that we do have a quorum. Please mark any members who aren't present. I believe that is Speaker Frierson. Absent excused. Um, mark any members present when they arrive. And I believe that's Assemblywoman Tolls. I know she is here. She just stepped out for a quick second. Um, good afternoon, presenters, um, audience, those listening in over the internet. I do want to go over some quick housekeeping items before we get started. I'd like to remind everyone to please silence your electronic. That goes for members and for members of the audience who are here to present or to testify. I would also like to remind everyone that exhibits, testimony, amendments, all those documents are due to our committee manager by noon on the day before the committee meeting. I would remind everyone to be courteous and respectful with others during the meeting. Please note that committee members will be using electronics. That's not a sign of inattention. We are just using our laptops to view exhibits and the bills. Presenters who are on Zoom, please keep yourselves muted, but keep your cameras on. That's the only way we can tell that you are with us. With that, we do have um, a pretty lengthy agenda today. For those of you who are listening in, I, I just want to let you guys know now that we had five bills listed for bill hearing. We will be rolling Assembly Bill 75 until next week. So we are pulling Assembly Bill 75 from, for the agenda. We will also be taking the bills out of order today. So for those who would like to know when their bill is up, we will be starting with Senate Bill 141, followed by Senate Bill 247, Senate Bill 308, and ending with Senate Bill 289. Okay, um, with that, I think we can go ahead and get started with our agenda. I'm going to start by opening the hearing on Senate Bill 141, which revises provisions relating to public works. Senator Brooks, welcome to Commerce and Labor, and welcome back to the room. You just left. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the Committee on Commerce and Labor. It is good to be back here. Um, I'm Senator Chris Brooks from Senate District 3 in, in the middle of Las Vegas. And today I'm here to present Senate Bill 141. Senate Bill 141 will remove the statutory expiration and allow for the continued use of construction manager at risk, or CMAR as we call it, by our state's public utilities or public entities, excuse me. This is an important bill because CMAR has proved to be a valuable construction method uh, uh, management, allowing public entities to control costs and budgets on some of our most unique and complex public projects. Recent CMAR projects include the Las Vegas Convention Center expansion, the National Guard Speedway Readiness Center, and the Pennington Engineering Building at UNR. Upcoming projects include the UNLV Engineering Building, the Clark County Water Reclamation District, Flamingo Water Resources Center, and the Grant Sawyer Office Building Remodel, just to name a few. CMAR allows the builder to collaborate with the designer and public agency early in the project design state to help avoid costly missteps or unforeseen design challenges. The process also requires the builder to agree to construct the project for a guaranteed maximum price, a GMP, and lessening the risk of cost overruns to the, to the uh, uh, taxpayers. CMAR is just one tool available to the public entities to deliver construction projects. When we invest in public infrastructure, it is critical that we apply the best, most efficient, and effective method of delivering the project. By allowing public entities the ability to continue to use CMAR, in addition to our other delivery methods, we are giving them the tools that they need to plan, design, and build projects as efficiently as possible. And I have with me today also uh, Brian Reeder uh, from Ferrari Public Affairs to answer any questions that, that the committee might have that I can't answer. And with that, I, I would like to just start walk through the bill very quickly, and then I can answer some questions. The bill, it, 
only does two things, and, and that is, one, remove the sunset of CMAR. Doesn't change uh, the, the mechanisms of CMAR, doesn't redefine CMAR. It just removes the sunset, and the sunset was there because we put it in place to see if we, uh, if we ha were successful in using this methodology, and it's turned out to be incredibly successful for the taxpayer, for the public entity, and for the contracting community. And so uh, here to remove the sunset. The second thing it does is it clarifies uh, uh, horizontal construction and vertical construction by um, adding just a few uh, uh, things that those two things would that those two definitions would cover, and it makes the two of them kind of conform with each other and how they're defined. And that is it. That is all the bill does. It does. It is a little confusing because it looks like we delete horizontal construction, or and we delete vertical construction, and we delete some of the CMR language. But that is the that was necessary for the mechanics of the bill. So you have to delete part of it to be able to preserve it in another uh, portion of the statute. So um, mechanically, though, the only or, or practically the only thing this does removes the sunset and and uh, changes. Uh, clarifies two of those definitions, horizontal construction and vertical construction. So with that, I could um, answer any questions, and, and Mr. Brian Reeder, like I said, is here to help me as well. Okay, committee members, it is time for questions. I am going to go to Assemblymember Kasama first. Senator, thank you for uh, being here. Assemblywoman uh, Kasama, District 2, for the record. Um, so, I, great overview. I, I've looked at this. I, um, my only uh, question, can you further clarify, there are so many deleted sections, and some of the definitions are in the deleted sections. They're put back in the new one, but there's such, so much of the section is completely deleted. It, you know, I'm just kind of wondering about the implications of, of that much. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Assemblywoman Kasama, it is incredibly confusing, and um, I, at my last bill hearing, had uh, our legal counsel write me a script that explained why we did that. I failed to bring that script with me, and I'm wondering if, there, if the legal counsel of this committee might be available to bail me out on exactly why we had to do that from the mechanics of taking it in and putting it out. And I will gladly go to our legal counsel, Mr. Sam Quast. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sam Quast, Committee Counsel. So, uh, in 2013, when the expiration was um, put on these provisions, they had to enact, uh, the legislature had to enact new provisions to account for those um, deleted sections. So, that's why you see those, all those sections in the uh, repealed. Uh, uh, sections. They're not repealing the sections from NRS because those haven't been enacted yet. They're due to be enacted when these provisions expire. So in order to remove that expiration, uh, the bill has to reach back into the original bill that passed that added the expirations and delete those sections that were meant to account for the sections that were going to be repealed but will no longer be repealed. So I hope that was uh, clarified. Oh yeah, that was real clear, thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, Assemblywoman uh, uh, Kasama, that was far, far better than what I did last time. I tried to explain that, so I appreciate that, Mr. Koss. Okay, members, any other questions for our presenter? Okay, thank you so much, Senator Brooks. At this time, I'm going to move into testimony in support of Senate Bill 141. I will take those here in Carson City first. Welcome, Mr. Reader. Thank you, Chair Hadegi and committee members. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Reader, for the record. 
from Ferrari Public Affairs representing the Nevada Contractors Association. I think the most of the committee knows NCA represents general and subcontractors and businesses affiliated with the commercial construction industry throughout Southern Nevada. I can be really brief. We, we brought the stakeholders together once again during the interim to discuss CMAR. And those stakeholders include our, our friends in labor, our public entities, subcontractor groups, to, to discuss what we wanted to do with CMAR. And there was unanimous agreement that the, the method's working and that we wanted to seek legislation to remove the sunset. So I want to thank the bill sponsor for working with us on the issue and thank the committee for hearing the bill and urge your support. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Reeder. Is there anyone else in? Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Lori Bagwell, the mayor of Carson City, and I want to thank you for the opportunity this afternoon to be here in person and speak with you all. Um, I just want to lend my support and ask for your support on this legislation. Carson City has used it successfully over the last few years, and one of the best projects I can des describe to you is right out your front door. If you look at our Main Street improvements, for those of you that have been here before, it's a wonderful project that we used with CMAR. And I want to add that one of the benefits that I don't think I've seen in prior testimony is how wonderful it is for the businesses that are impacted by large projects. When you have a CMAR, they're in the front end of the project and can meet with the businesses and to help schedule it so that it has the least impact when you do a, a major project. It really hurts the business when you're gonna do a road. We all need it but it hurts their business. So they were able to work together to design the schedule, when the timing is, when are you gonna bring the water trucks through, when are you gonna do the things. So I just wanted to lend support and tell you that it actually opens up so much more than just having a CMAR project. It's about working as a community together to get the best you can with the money that we have. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. This was way, way too easy. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. You. Welcome, Ms. Motorex. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Alexis Motorex with the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors representing the commercial construction industry in Northern Nevada. We are here in support of SB 141 and appreciate Senator Brooks for bringing it forward. Everybody's already said the reasons that it's fabulous. Um, and it's time for it to become a permanent part of statute. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else in Carson City wishing to testify in support? Okay, um, broadcasting. Can we go to the telephone line? Testify in support of Senate Bill 141. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 666, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name's Warren Hardy, W-A-R-R-E-N, last name Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y, representing the Urban Consortium here today in support of this legislation. Uh, at the risk of sounding like an old timer, this is a piece of legislation that I actually helped bring forward at the request of AGC uh, during my tenure in the legislature. And at the time we were concerned, this is, a, this is a, a process that works very, very well in the private sector. It's a preferred process in the private sector. We weren't sure at the time as, in terms of how this was gonna translate to the public sector. Uh, so that's why we put the limitations and the things we did on it. And so I'm pleased to report that it, 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 this is a process that is working very, very well for the public sector as a tool in their toolbox to, to use in a, appropriate cases. So on behalf of the Urban Consortium, which is made up of the cities of Las Vegas, Henderson, Reno, and Sparks, we are here in support of this and thank uh, Senator Brooks for bringing it forward and pleased to see that this process will continue on. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 411, please slowly state and slow your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, this is Lindsay Anderson, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N on behalf of the Washoe County School District. And we are here in strong support of SB 141, and thank you, Senator Brooks, for bringing it forward. 
Fortunately, the Washoe County School District has engaged in one of the largest construction programs since 2017, building three new middle schools, a new high school, and several elementary schools, along with major renovations, expansions, and remodels of our existing schools. CMAR has been an important part of using our taxpayer dollars in the most efficient way for our new school prototype designs, complicated remodels during the school year, and other central services projects like our food production facility that require special considerations. We continue to use design, build, and other project delivery methods when it makes sense, but CMAR is an important option for us as we continue our substantial school construction projects. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 735. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Justin Harrison, J-U-S-T-I-N-H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N, representing Clark County, uh, here today in support of Senate Bill 131. And would like to thank Senator Brooks for bringing the measure forward. Uh, this is a project delivery method that we have seen used successfully in Clark County, specifically through our Department of Aviation and through the uh, Clark County Flood Control District. This is, uh, we believe, in a, an important step in, in making uh, CMAR a, a permanent part of statute and uh, a successful project delivery method going forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 401. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and maybe begin. Hi, this is Kathy Flanagan, that's F-L-A-N-A-G-A-N, representing the Southern Nevada Water Authority. We are in support of this measure, and we thank Senator Brooks for, bring, for sponsoring this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your brevity and for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Look at the last three digits of 836. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, this is Jessica Ferrato, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-F-E-R-R-A-T-O, here today on behalf of Granite Construction in strong support of SC-144. CMAR is another helpful tool for the construction industry to use. We want to thank Senator Brooks and all of the involved stakeholders for their work on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Ferrato. Broadcasting next caller. If you recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 141, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Call out with the last three digits of 853. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 853, please press star six to unmute. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Michael Flores, uh, for the record with the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-F-L-O-R-E-S. And I will be very brief. I wanna thank the sponsor, uh, Senator Brooks for this bill. And we are a strong supporter of the bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 735, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Eileen, A-I-L-E-E-N, Pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, with the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. The RTC of Southern Nevada is in strong support of Senate Bill 141, and we thank Senator Brooks for bringing this bill forward and the committee for hearing this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 873, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and maybe again. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is David Fromer. I am the uh, Associate Vice President of Planning, Construction, and Real Estate at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So I'm here to speak in support of SB 141. Having CMAR continue to be available as a construction delivery method is very important to UNLV, and we use all construction delivery methods, CMAR, design, bid, 
and design and build. Uh, it's especially helpful where there are complex projects with unique operating uh, parameters and other complexities uh, during the construction process. Uh, we thank Senator Brooks for his efforts on this and uh, appreciate you hearing us. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 692. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and we begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Brzezinski, M A R Y P I E R C Z Y N S K I. And I'm representing the Nevada Association of School Superintendents. We're in strong support of this bill. It helps both urban and rural school districts. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 069. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and we begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kanani Espinoza, K-A-N-A-N-I-E-S-P-I-N-O-Z-A, with the Rowe Law Group presenting the American Council of Engineering Companies of Nevada, known as ACEC. ACEC represents our state's design and engineering community, and we'd like to thank Senator Brooks for bringing this legislation forward. We stand in support of Senate Bill 141. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 150. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 150. Please press star six to unmute. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Patty Charlton, P-A-T-T-Y, last name Charlton, C-H-A-R-L-T-O-N. I'm with the College of Southern Nevada. And I wanted to thank Senator Brooks for bringing this um, sunset provision listing uh, to, um, to the legislature and want to say that on behalf of the College of Southern Nevada, we support this um, revision wholeheartedly. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. We will now go to those in opposition of Senate Bill 141, and we will start here in Carson City. Is there anyone wishing to provide testimony in opposition? Okay, seeing none and having no one signed in on Zoom, let's go ahead and go to the telephone line. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 141, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 080, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of, digits of 080, please press star six to unmute. Broadcasting, broadcasting, we can go ahead to the next caller and come back. Okay, sounds great. Uh, Chair, that is the only caller that we have uh, in the queue for opposition. Okay, then let's just try them one more time. And if we can't get them, I would encourage the caller to submit their testimony in writing. Okay, uh, the caller did just drop off from okay. the call. Okay, then uh, seeing no other callers, we will move to testimony in neutral. Is there anyone in Carson City wishing to testify in the neutral position? Okay, and seeing no one signed in on Zoom, broadcasting, can we do a check of the telephone line? Yes, Chair, to testify in neutral on Senate Bill 141, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Brooks, 
Would you like to give closing remarks? Thank you so much for hearing this bill this afternoon, and I hope you support it. Actually, Senator Brooks, you should have just said no. We now have a question for you. <laughs> oh. uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm kidding, Senator Brooks. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not throwing a rock at this one. I'm just, I was just going to say thank you for working with all the stakeholders. I know there's a whole host of folk that always have concerns with CMAR. Having had an opportunity to work with that, I just wanted to say thank you for working with everybody, and kudos to you, brother. I virtual hug right now. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Thank you, Assemblyman. I appreciate that. Okay, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 141. Next item on our agenda is Senate Bill 247. I do see that we have Senator Dondera Loop here. Senator Dondera Loop, when you're ready, you, you can get st started. I'm going to open the hearing on Senate Bill 247, which revises provisions relating to apprenticeship. Welcome, Senator, and welcome, Mr. Stanley. Good afternoon, Chair Hadegui and members of the committee. For the record, I am Marilyn Dondero Loop and I represent Senate District 8. Today I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 247 in its first reprint, which relates to apprentices and the apprenticeship program in Nevada. An apprenticeship is an industry-driven, high-quality career pathway where employers can develop and prepare any future workforce and individuals can obtain paid work experience classroom instruction, and a portable nationally recognized credential. The National Apprenticeship Act of 1937 directs the United States Department of Labor to formulate and promote the furtherance of labor standards necessary to safeguard the welfare of apprentices. The DOL has carried out these provisions for developing a system in which the DOL, or a DOL-recognized state apprenticeship agency, registers several individual programs as meeting federal and or state standards. In Nevada, the apprenticeship program is administered by the state apprenticeship director under the direction of the governor's office of workforce innovation and with the advice and guidance of the state apprenticeship council. The council has the authority to approve and register or reject proposed programs of apprenticeship. Registered apprenticeships are apprenticeship programs that are registered with the DOL and governed by regulations laid out under National Apprenticeship Act. Senate Bill 247 ensures that the apprenticeship programs in Nevada train individuals in skills and knowledge that are applicable to the industry and not just specific to one company or employer. I'd like to provide a brief summary of the bill before I turn it over to Mr. Stanley. The provisions of this bill generally revise existing state requirements regarding registered apprenticeships to more closely conform with federal regulations. I will also highlight the amendments made to the bill. Section one of the bill refi revises the division, sorry, the definition of a program to more closely conform to federal regulations. Section two of the bill revises existing statutory requirements for the reapproval and registration of such programs in conformity with federal regulations to enable them with one exception to be structured as a time-based program which preserves the existing requirement that an apprentice acquire at least 2,000 hours of on-the-job training, a competency-based program that measures skill acquisition through an apprentice's successful demonstration of acquired skills and knowledge, or a hybrid approach that combines elements of both. An apprentice, an apprentice program in the construction trades must be structured as a time-based program. Section two of the bill also prohibits the State Apprenticeship Council from approving a program that is proposed in a skilled trade when there is already a program that has been approved and registered by the council, unless the program re requires the completion of at least, at least as many hour, hours of on-the-job learning or at least the same number and quality of skills as all existing programs. The bill also prescribes the elements of the council and required to consider in order to determine whether to approve or reject such a program. We amended the bill to clarify that a proposed apprenticeship program must provide training for the development of skills to allow the apprentice to practice the skilled trade generally rather than a particular employer. 
Next, subsection 1D, section 5 of section 2, clarifies that a proposed apprenticeship program must include a schedule of wages which are not less than a minimum wage allowed by federal or state laws, a collective bargaining agreement, or the minimum apprenticeship wages established by the council. We also clarified that the council may condition approval of the proposed program on the payment of compensation to apprentices instead of wages and benefits. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Stanley for further information and clarification on the bill. Thank you, Senator, and welcome, Mr. Stanley, when you're ready. Thank you, Chairman Hardy and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bill Stanley, for the record, representing uh, the Southern Nevada Building Construction Trades Council. SB 247 is introduced by Senator Don Darrell Loop at the request of the Southern Nevada Building Trades along with the Northern Nevada Building Trades Union. We thank her for her leadership on this issue. I have with me today to introduce this bill two individuals, or three individuals, I'm sorry, Rob Benner from the Northern Nevada Building Trades, Archie Walden, Apprenticeship Coordinator from the Southern Nevada Labor's Training Trust, and he is also the chairman of the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council. Uh, additionally, I have Randy Canale, Apprenticeship Coordinator for Local 350 Pipe Trades Apprenticeships here in Northern Nevada, and he is also a member of the state's Apprenticeship Council. They will deliver their remarks hopefully briefly, and uh, we'll answer, are here to, to answer any questions that this committee may have. We have worked with the stakeholders from INCHI and other registered apprenticeship programs to ensure both the expansion of apprenticeship opportunities in Nevada and the preservation of the Building Trades Apprenticeship Program model, and are seeking the passage of SB 247 to ensure the following, that only work-based learning should be registered as an apprenticeship program and are registered in Nevada. That emerging industries have the statutory structure to create career pathways through apprenticeship. And three, to ensure that building trades apprenticeship programs recognized as the gold standard of work-based learning, remain and maintain their proven delivery method. This bill is that straightforward. The statutory scheme, as it ex currently exists in NRS 610, has from its inception created to regulate building trades apprenticeship programs. No other programs existed or were contemplated at the time the statutes were created. As non-traditional programs have been introduced, their approval by the State Apprenticeship Council has been difficult to say the least. The statute as presently constructed is based on the building trades model and does not contemplate any other delivery method. In section 2.1 of the bill, we are seeking these changes to facilitate the approval of these non-traditional programs and their delivery methods by recognizing other apprenticeship delivery models and methods. In section 2.2 of the bill, we are clarifying when and how a parallel program is to be approved and how the State Apprenticeship Council should consider them. In section 2.2H of the bill, we are providing the SAC with guidance when considering such parallel programs for approval. We have had numerous conversations with interest parties on the compensation issue addressed in the last sentence of the bill. I want to say first, this language is permissive. It says the council may, it doesn't say they shall, it is permissive in nature. Two, that the State Apprenticeship Council requires the establishment of the apprenticeship wage rate annually when they submit their form 5910 that is required by the federal government. There have been a lot of conversations about whether or not the State Apprenticeship Council has the authority to create the minimum apprenticeship wage. I can tell you they have been doing it for decades and it is a requirement of 29 CFR 29. And the 50, form 5910 that is required to be submitted by each apprenticeship program on an annual basis is a federal form that does just that establishes the minimum wage rate for apprentices. The State Apprenticeship Council sets the minimum apprenticeship wage annually, and we've recently done it. It's somewhere short of $15 an hour. It's 
and 87 cents, I, I believe, um, in, in that ballpark. The minimum apprentice wage in any particular craft should be consistent across all programs. In other words, an electrical apprentice should make should be comparable to what a no matter what program that electrician apprenticeship comes from, it should be comparable. If he's a carpenter apprentice and he's in one program or another program, his wages should be comparable. Uh, and the apprentice wages required uh, should, should, should demonstrate that. There has also been some conversation about the word compensation. We amended the bill. The bill originally had wages and benefits. We amended the bill and put compensation at the request of stakeholders who, who had asked us that they believe that wages and benefits may have led the State Apprenticeship Council to assume that the benefit schedule for any one apprentice had to be the same, meaning that if one apprentice had vacation pay, they all had to have vacation pay. Or if one apprentice had a defined benefit pension plan, that all apprentices had to have a defined benefit pension plan. I'm here to tell you that was never the intent. Therefore, we agreed to change wages and benefits to compensation. And compensation does not mean that an individual has to have the same schedule of benefits if, benefit, if they have any benefits at all. It could all be paid in wages, just as we do currently under NRS 338 in the, work, I mean, in the prevailing wage statute. Compensation does not dictate what type of benefit schedule and combination thereof with wages that an individual must earn, only that the total shall be equal. So, uh, so with that uh, explanation, I was asked to give that explanation outside the room, so I'm trying to ad lib to give it to you here. And so uh, uh, I bear with me here. So at this time, I thank you for uh, your time this morning, Chairwoman, uh, and members of the committee. Uh, I have Mr. Rob Benner from the Northern Nevada Building Trades. He, I see him on screen. He may want to add a few comments, and, and only if uh, there are questions from the two individuals who serve on the State Apprenticeship Council, uh, we'll go to them. So thank you, Chairwoman and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Oh, Mr. Benner, welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. R-O-B-E-N-N-E-R -E -E uh, with the Northern Nevada Building Trades. Uh, the intent of this bill is to remove the conflict between traditional apprenticeship programs and non-traditional programs and will bring Nevada's law in line with the federal regulations. Current Nevada law only provides for traditional apprenticeship programs to develop and registered by the building trades. Now, non-traditional programs want to develop other delivery methods for their industries. SB 247 would let the building trades maintain their apprenticeship programs while allowing others to develop new ones that fit their particular industries without affecting the building trades model. Uh, this bill will protect apprentices from low-quality programs, preserve valuable taxpayer money, and maintain the integrity of the existing registered apprenticeship system. And uh, thank you, and uh, that's that will be it for my comments. Thank you, Mr. Benner. And Mr. Stanley, you said Mr. Canelli and Mr. Walden here for questions only? Okay, then are you ready for questions, Ms. Yes. Mr. Okay, perfect. Committee members. Do you have any questions for our presenters? I'm going to go to Assembly Member Tolls first. I thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you. It's good to see you both. And I just want to say that I, um, it's great to see you, Mr. Benner, on on video. And um, I've I've just been so impressed over the years with um, the apprenticeship process and I, I've met so many talked to so many individuals who've really really just um, beamed with pride over it and so I appreciate everything that we do to try and continue to improve upon it also really appreciate your answers um, to some of the questions uh, even if you were doing it freestyle you you did it really well in terms of just maybe the area of concern here is on that last sentence where a program could be rejected so could you just walk us through a little bit more how it would be determined that a program would be rejected? Because I think that's where the, most of the concern lies. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. The, 
from through you to <laughs> assembling one. And told. Mr. Stanley, on anyone who decides to answer, you guys can go directly to the members. Thank you. So there was only one of us could be here in person, either Rob or myself. So we picked the younger one. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, so thank you. Uh, that last sentence, um, assembly woman told. So, um, the council may condition approval of the proposed program on the payment of compensation to apprentice that is equal to or greater than the compensation provided by the approved and registered apprenticeship program. So this would contemplate, we already had a program in place for, and I'm just gonna pick some, I'm gonna pick on my own trade because it's easier than you don't get in trouble, right? I'm an elevator constructor by trade, okay? So if the elevator constructors already has a program that is established and approved by the State Apprenticeship Council and someone brings another program that was to train apprentices as, as elevator constructors, we would look at what the compensation was for those elevator constructors, and it's $40 an hour. Then the new program would have to have a base rate of $40 an hour, however they got there, through whatever mechanism of benefits that they supplied, so long as they accrue to the benefit of the apprentice. So it could be vacation pay, it could be a pension, a 401k, a defined benefit, a defined contribution, it could be sick leave. It could, all of those things that go into a compensation package could be considered to determine if the two programs are equal in nature for the total compensation package. What we're trying to avoid here is pitting one apprenticeship program against the other. For instance, as many of you know, in the last um, session, last uh, legislative um, session, we passed SB uh, 207, which was the Apprenticeship Utilization Act, where we now have a requirement to use a number of apprentices, 10% on, on vertical construction and 3% on horizontal construction. So if you have a contractor who is required to use apprentices on a prevailing wage job. We don't want folks choosing between one program on, over the other one for the sake of using an apprentices because one has a more favorable wage rate than the other program. We would like them considered the same and that individuals could go out and work and have that opportunity to train the next generation of construction workers. And so that's really what we're getting at here. We're, there's no hidden agenda here. We want, and, I, and I've told you guys, uh, the folks that sat in this room uh, two years ago, I, I, I come from the union industry side of this, and I don't apologize for it, but let me t I want everyone in the apprenticeship business. I want the non-union in the apprenticeship business, and I want the union folks to stay in the apprenticeship business. We have a need to train the next generation of construction workers. And we know that the best methodology that has been proved over the last 70 years to train them is through work-based learning that is an apprenticeship program. And it turns out the best skilled workforce in the world. I want everybody in the game. Because see, and I'll, and I'll be honest with you, the selfish part of me is this. If only the union, program, union company are in the apprenticeship program or in the apprenticeship business, then contractors that are training apprentices have a higher labor burden than those that aren't. We're more competitive when more people get into the apprenticeship business. But I think it is better for the industry and I'm being as, as frank as I can be with you, as someone told, I hope you appreciate it. I mean, that is, I said that two years ago on SB 207, and I say that here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Follow-up? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. I love your passion, and th uh, thank you for that. And um, and I think part of this is just getting the record clear, and I think, you you know, I appreciate that you're answering the questions just so that um, those concerns um, can be addressed. And so in that example that you gave, let's say there's two different programs that if I, if I understand the concern, there's two different programs that have different rates. Um, and then a third program is rejected because we're using one rate versus the other. Is that a scenario that might happen? And how do we reconcile that? Um, just to make, or how do we avoid, you know, sort of a stepping ladder of now all of a sudden we're just, everybody's 
moving up and up and up um, in in those wage scales. So I think I think just maybe clarifying some of those on the implementation side would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Simon. So I think it, I think we have to take a step back. So when an apprenticeship program moves forward to be registered by the State Apprenticeship Council, they have to bring a set of standards forward. And those standards are reviewed. And in those standards, they have the curriculum, and they also have the scale of wages. Because an apprenticeship program is required to escalate the wages as you become more competent in the trade. So for instance, and you usually call them terms. So a first year or first term apprentice versus a second term, when he moves from first year to second year, he will have a, a corresponding uh, raise in his wages. So let's say you have a four year apprenticeship program. So by the time an individual goes from the first year to the fourth year of an apprenticeship program, their wages will have changed significantly because we understand that their ability to perform the work has, has gone up. Their understanding of the craft is increased and they can do more of the work. So that is a provision that is in the federal regulations that we have to escalate. Those. So the wage schedule is in the standards as they are submitted to the State Apprenticeship Council. So when the State Apprenticeship Council is looking at the standards and the State Apprenticeship Director works with a new program, we should not have that situation, uh, as someone told, because the State Apprenticeship Director is charged in statute with working with new program, and they, he, he at this point, Mr. Richard Williams, uh, the State Apprenticeship Director, should work with that new sponsor and those standards to assure that when they get before the State Apprenticeship Council, that those wage schedules are the same. So there should be no rejection of any apprenticeship program at that point because the standards, while the curriculum may be a little different or written by somebody else, you still have the same OJT hours, you still have the same uh, classroom hours required. And by the way, in statute, that's a minimum of 144 classroom hours per year and 2,000 on-the-job training hours per year. That's not only in our statutes in Nevada, those are in the federal statutes uh, also, okay, that we, we're required to follow under 29 CFR 29. So that scenario, if it's done correctly, as some of should never happen. Great, thank you so much. Members, any other questions? Okay, at this time, then we are gonna move into the testimony portion of the bill hearing. I am gonna start in Carson City with testimony and support. If there's anyone here in Carson City, you can please approach the dais. Oh, just make sure you turn on the microphone. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Uh, my name is Greg Dye, G-R-E-G-D-Y-E. -E. I am the general manager for, manager for Briggs Electric. I am also the representative for the National Electrical Contractors Association, the Greater Sacramento and Rito Divisions. We are very thankful for Senator Dondero Loop for sponsoring this bill. Uh, this is very essential to the safety and health of our construction trades. Uh, the difference between a job and a career is a registered apprenticeship program. There are low-value programs out there that represent themselves as, as creating journeymen who have skills that are not transferable to other trades or other, journey, or other companies. Uh, this levels the playing field, raises the bar on apprenticeship, and it is a great bill. I uh, thank you for supporting it. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Vince Saavedra, for the record, V-I-N-C-E, Saavedra, S-A-A-V-E-D-R-A. -A -A. I'm here on behalf of the iron workers of uh, Nevada. Uh, I just want to echo the remarks of the gentleman before me, Mr. Stanley, and let you know they were in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saavedra. Nice to see you again. Is there anyone else here in Carson City wishing to testify in support? Okay, is there anyone on Zoom wishing to testify in support? 
If you would just turn your camera on. Okay, broadcasting, if we could check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 247. Testify in support of Senate Bill 247. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 219. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and maybe. Hello, my name is Wendy Newman. That's W E N D I. N-E-W-M-A-N, and the Executive Director of Unified Construction Industry Council, and we absolutely support SB 247. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, next caller in support. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone here in Carson City wishing to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 247? Okay, uh, is there anyone on Zoom? Broadcasting, if we could please check the telephone line. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 247, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, digits of 250, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair and the committee members for the for the record. Uh, I am Mac Bybee, M-A-C-B-Y-B-E-E. -E. I'm the president and CEO of the uh, Associated Builders and Contractors Nevada chapter. My organization is the only association in the state that offers open shop apprenticeship programs in multiple trades. We are currently training more than 300 apprentices. My organization has been committed to apprenticeship and workforce development and construction industry for decades. In fact, ABC Nevada is the reason open shop apprenticeship is even available, not just in Nevada, but the entire country. We have worked in a bipartisan manner on a variety of different workforce development efforts, including the rewrite of the laws governing apprenticeship when it was moved from the Labor Commissioner's Office to Owen under Governor Sandoval. Most of SB 247 includes reasonable changes. However, the last sentence of SB 247, specifically subsection 3 of section 2, lines 28 through 31, authorizes the State Apprenticeship Council to condition approval of new programs on whether apprentice wages are the same as existing programs in the trade. Currently, the State Apprenticeship Council establishes minimum wage requirements for, for apprentices. This line creates a conflicting wage requirement that can be applied arbitrarily and without consistency. One program could be approved with Apprenticeship Council's promulgated wage standard, and the next program could be rejected because it does not meet a wage scale established by an existing program. This inconsistency, this inconsistency will undoubtedly hurt efforts to get new programs approved. The legislation can stand alone without this provision. We are already facing a massive shortage in skilled labor in the construction industry. Setting up additional barriers to training is not what our state or the construction industry needs to succeed. I'm requesting this one sentence be removed from SB 247. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting, is there any other callers? Caller with the last three digits of 781. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Chris Ferrari on behalf of the Nevada Contractors Association, uh, F-E-R-R-A-R-I. Uh, echoing the comments of Mr. Bybee, we're also here today in opposition. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm broadcasting. Next caller. You recently joined the call and would like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 247. Please press star nine now. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. We will now go to those in the neutral position of Senate Bill 247 here in Carson City. Is there anyone on Zoom? Just turn on your camera so we can see you. Okay, broadcasting, can we please check the telephone line? 
to testify in neutral on Senate Bill 247, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in the neutral position at this time. Thank you so much, BPS. Senator Dondera Loop, would you like to give closing remarks? Thank you very much, Chair Hattigay, members of the committee, Marilyn Dondero Loop, for the record. I thank you for your time today, and I would just urge your support of this piece of legislation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 247, and don't go too far. We have you up next. Okay, at this time, I would like to open the hearing on Senate Bill 308, which provides for the establishment of a work-sharing program. Welcome back, Senator Dondera Loop, when you are ready. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Hadegi and committee members. For the record, I am Marilyn Dondera Loop, representing Senate District 8 in Clark County. I am pleased to present Senate Bill 308, a bill that seeks to establish a work sharing program which is an alternative to layoffs for employers experiencing a reduction in available work. The COVID 19 recession abruptly displaced millions of workers in the United States threatened with the loss of stable housing and imminent risk of financial ruin. In Nevada, there have been more than 878,000 new claims for unemployment since March 14th of 2020. Unemployment insurance is the most important fiscal response the state and the federal government has during a recession because it sends timely targeted and temporary financial assistance to those directly affected by the economic downturn. However, what these workers need most is to know that they will be able to return to their previous jobs as the pandemic recedes and business returns. Workers who believe that they are likely to be called back and to a steady job can relieve workers' anxiety, which can bolster morale and increase consumer spending. Work share programs benefit businesses, workers, and states. Businesses retain their trained workforce, for easy recall to full-time work when economic conditions improve. Workers keep their jobs instead of being laid off and collect reduced unemployment benefits to partially replace their lost wages. States save money by paying only partial unemployment claims instead of paying full benefits to laid off workers. Under approved work share programs, employees qualify for a percentage of unemployment benefits equal to the percentage by which their hours have been reduced. For example, an employee whose hours are cut by 10% would qualify for 10% of the state's established weekly unemployment benefit amount. While that does not fully replace the lost wages, the amount supplements a worker's income until they are recalled to full-time work. Currently, 27 states have work share programs established in law. Some of the states, uh, for example, Arizona, Col California, Colorado, Connecticut, Kansas, Maine, Minnesota, Nebraska, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Washington, and Wisconsin. The bill is quite long, but I will provide you with an overview of some of the sections, and then I will turn it over to uh, some of the Dieter um, experts who are with me today. Section 11 will require the administrator of the Employment Security Division of the Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation to the extent that funding is available to establish a work share program to authorize payments for work sharing benefits to establish employees whose usual weekly hours have been reduced by a work sharing employer. The administrator is authorized to adopt regulations for administering a work sharing program. Section 12 requires an employer who wishes to participate in the work sharing program to submit a work sharing plan to the administrator for approval. Some of this information includes identification information of the affected unit, identification of usual weekly hours of work, and a certificate, certification that if the employer provides health and retirement benefits to employees in the affected unit, such benefits will continue under the same terms and conditions. The written approval of the bargaining agent designated in a collective bargaining agreement if employees affected unit are part of such collective bargaining agreement. 
an agreement to provide the administrator certain reports concerning the work sharing plan and allow the administrator or his or her designee to access all records necessary to approve, deny, or if approved, continue to evaluate the plan. Any other provisions added to the work sharing plan by the administrator that the Federal Secretary of Labor determines to be appropriate for a work sharing plan. Section 13 requires a work sharing employer that provides health and retirement benefits to an employee under a defined plan to credit the hours that are reduced under the work sharing plan for the purposes of participation, vesting, and accrual of benefits as the usual hours have not been reduced. However, the dollar amount of the employer contributions may be less due to the reduction in the compensation of the employee. Section 14 requires the administrator to approve or disapprove a work sharing plan submitted by an employer within 15 days of receipt, promptly give written notice of the approval or disapproval. It all, section 15 requires the notice to include an agreed upon effective date and expiration date. Section 14 also provides for certain circumstances when the administrator must not approve the plan. Section 15 additionally provides that the work sharing employer may terminate the plan at any time by submitting a notice to the administrator and authorizes the employer to submit a new application at any time. After expiration or termination, Section 16 includes provisions when the administrator may revoke approval of the work sharing plan. Section 17 authorizes a work share employer to request a modification of an approved plan when the administrator must approve or disapprove within 15 days. Section 18 provides that a person is eligible to receive work sharing benefits within respect to any week only if the person is monetarily eligible for unemployment compensation and is employed as a member of an affected unit under an approved plan. The person must be available to work the usual hours of work while collecting the unemployment benefit. Section 18 also provides that the person is deemed unemployed in any week during the duration of such work sharing plan if his or her compensation is reduced based on a reduction of usual hours of work. Section 19 prescribes the manner in which the weekly benefit amount for work sharing benefits are calculated, which is proportional to the reduction in hours for the employee under the work sharing plan. This section also provides that a person may be eligible for unemployment compensation and work sharing benefits as appropriate, but prohibits a person from receiving combined benefits in a benefit year that are more than the maximum entitlement established for regular unemployment compensation. Section 20 requires work sharing benefits to be treated in the same manner as regular unemployment compensation with respect to the charges to the experience rating account of an employer and the determination of the amount of reimbursement in lieu of contributions due from an employer that elects to make reimburse, reimbursement in lieu of contributions. And finally, Section 21 provides that a person who has exhausted benefits from the regular unemployment compensation and work sharing plan may be eligible for state extended benefits. Thank you, Chair Hadegi, and um, I would turn this over to um, Dieter if they have any additional comments right now, and if not, we can go to uh, questions. Do they have prepared remarks? Do they have prepared remarks, Senator? Yes. I'm waiting um, for them to good answer. Afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes, we, yes, we do. Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Frischman. I'm with the Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation with the Employment Security Division. On May 10th, 2020, the U.S. DOL issued a news release announcing the availability of up to $100 million in grants to support the implementation, promotion, and improved administration of work share programs. The deadline to apply for these grants is December 31st, 2023. It is important to understand that participation in the work share program is, voluntarily, is voluntary and is contingent upon the employer deciding to opt into the program. It provides an additional tool in the employer's toolbox allowing the employer to make a business decision on what is best for their individual business needs. 
Currently, um, as the senator mentioned, there are approximately 27 states that have enacted state laws allowing them to access federal grant monies for implementation of short-time compensation programs. That's all I have. Thank you. And with that, Madam Chair, uh, we'll stand for questions. Okay, I'm gonna start questions um, with Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I, and I have a couple, so whoever is the best to address it, that would be great. So everybody knows where I come from, so of course my first question is gonna be about collective bargaining agreements. Um, so on page five, section eight, sub eight there, any employee that is affected unit covered by a collective bargaining agreement, the written approval of the bargaining agent is, is designated. So, so basically you're saying if this isn't in your CBA, it can't happen. We, we, it's not, because sometimes statute will trump a collective bargaining agreement. We understand law is stronger than a union contract. I don't necessarily agree with that all the time, but, um, so if there is a collective bargaining agreement in place, that that will be the guiding force behind this decision. Thank you, um, Assemblywoman Carlton. And I'm going to ask uh, the people on the Zoom screen to jump in there, please. Thank you. Um, Jeff Frischman, for the record. Um, as you've stated, I, that is my understanding of it as well, um, Assemblywoman. And, and thank you much, very much, Madam Chair. I, eventually, I'm going to need something more than it's my understanding. Um, uh, yes or no would be really, really great. So um, I'm going to go to the other side of the coin before I had a union job and I was waiting tables. And I'm going to use the example of I'm working in a family restaurant. Let's just say it was a Marie Callender's. Um, and... Um, the, a, a downturn happened and Marie Callender's came forward to say we would like to do a work sharing agreement and the employer would make that decision. The employees wouldn't be involved in it at all. And then with that decision made, that employer could share that job between let's say two servers. The servers will be compensated for the lost hours and possibly the benefits, but how do the tips get taken care of in this scheme? Because it's not about how many days, you, uh, I mean, that's great for the employer because the employee's still getting that Dieter component, but in a lot of jobs, it's the tips. And how, how do you deal with that? How will that be made up to that employee? Thank you, Assemblywoman. Um, I'm, I'm going to let Dieter answer. I, I think I know the answer, but I'd prefer to have my friends above me on the screen answer that. Thank you. Always good to phone a friend. Jeff Frischman for the record. When an employer reports an employee's wages to the division, those wages would include a tip, the amount that they would have earned in tips. Those, so those tip monies would be reflected in the calculation for the total weekly benefit amount that that waitress would be entitled to. So would that be the allocated tip system that the federal government has set up where I have an allocated tip amount that's applied every hour that I work because that's the amount that I pay taxes on or would it be the actual amount of tips that the server makes declared or would it be like the credit card tips? There's, there's three different ways to record tips. Jeff Frischman, for the record, it would be based on the amount of tips that are reported by the employer. So however the employer calculates that tip or the tip pool, that would be the calculation that we would use in order to determine that weekly benefit amount. So the employee would not have a voice in that at all, just the employer. 
Jeff Frischman, for the record, that is true, yes. And, and thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure that we get that on the record because a lot of people live off of their tips. And if, it, if the employer is reporting it, it may not actually reflect the amount of money that that tipped person is making. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. We know the service industry in Las Vegas is huge, and we know those restaurants have been hit really hard, and we wanna do everything we can to get them back up on their feet. We wanna help employers. I'm actually supportive of a restaurant association bill this year for the first time in 24 years, but I don't wanna see the tipped folks end up losing money in the long run because that's the biggest part of their wages is the tips, not the hourly wage. Not every server in Las Vegas makes a good hourly wage. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, members of the committee, any other questions? I'm gonna go to Assembly Member Tolls. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I have two questions, if I may. Um, one is in, uh, let's see, if I'm looking at section, oh, section 12 on page four, down to subsection three, where it talks about the reduction may, must not be less than 10% and not more than 60%. And just wondering how we came up with those percentages, because um, I would think that 10%, you'd trigger a lot more applicants if we're just reducing somebody's hours by 10%, um, and, you know, versus I know a lot of other states, as I just looked it up quickly, are more in that, you know, 20 to 40 percent range, um, and, and there's a good portion that are 10 percent, but I just wondered how we came up with that number. Does that expand the reach? And then my second question will just be in regards to Dieter capacity to be able to implement this program, because we know Dieter's had a pretty busy year. Thank you very much, Assemblywoman Tolls. You know, this is really great because I can see a reflection. It's almost like they're my brain, and so I'm going to let them go ahead and keep answering. Thank you. Jeff Frischman, <laughs> thank you, Jeff Frischman, for the record. Um, let me say that um, as far as our capacity, there is a um, amendment to this, which um, would mean that we would not have to implement this until July of 2022. And it is our belief that we would be able to implement and get this off the ground, um, allowing us it's 13 months, 14 months from now. And we believe we could accomplish that. Um, regarding the 10%, um, to be very honest, I'm not sure on the, the bill when it was written as to why the 10 and 60%, that's an answer I, I honestly just don't know the or a question that I honestly don't know the answer to. Thank you. I always appreciate that honesty. We, <laughs> we've all given that same answer at some point. So thank you. Thank you very much. And, and Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record, if you'll see at the very end, the 2022 he's referring to in the first is in the first reprint where that date is. And I believe when we crafted the bill, I think we looked at, if I remember correctly, we looked at other states and what they had done and that's where the 10 to 60% was assigned. Thank you, Madam Chair, I, that, that triggered one more follow-up. Um, uh, just really quick, Senator Don Darrow Loop, um, is there an additional amendment or was he referring to a past amendment that was already included? He was referring included? Okay. to the past amendment that is in the first reprint. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Assembly Member Tolls. Thank you. So do we have estimates, um, and, and I know it's voluntary, so it's, it may be hard, too hard to make an estimate, but do we have an estimate if this were enacted in July of 2022, uh, how, many, how many businesses and, and employees might uh, participate, maybe based on the track record of those 27 other states that also have implemented this? Marilyn Dondero Loop, for the uh, record, thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, I will let Dieter jump in there, but because this, you are absolutely right, this is May, it's not a, you know, have to. And so we, it would be really hard to come up with a, a standard number because two small businesses right next to each other, one may do it and one may not. Okay. Next we will go Jeff to- Jeff Frischman for the- 
I'm sorry if that's sufficient. I, I could add more to that answer or. You what, can go ahead, Mr. Pleasure. Freshman. You can. Jeff Freshman, for the record. Um, when we first saw this bill, we did contact several other states to understand just how many employers actually um, utilize this choice or opt into the program. Um, one of the states we contacted was the state of Oregon, and the state of Oregon indicated that they were receiving less than 150, I think was the number, per year prior to the pandemic. After the pandemic hit, that grew to over 2,000. But let's say in normal times, our expectation is it would be used. Oregon also has approximately um, double the number of employers that we have here in Nevada. So we would assume it would be about half of that 150. That's an assumption based on the numbers from Oregon. We also, while touching with other states, I believe it was the state of Oklahoma told us that they had less than five employers in a year that were using it prior to the pandemic. So it's not necessarily a um, program that is highly used and a lot of employers seem to opt into, but it certainly was there at the beginning of the pandemic for some of those states that had implemented early. Thank you for that. And I do want to jump in, Mr. Hirschman. I'm not, I think this question would be directed to you since you have spoken with other states, but do you have any figures on the states have that have implemented these work sharing um, programs? Have full unemployment numbers gone down? No. Uh, uh, Jeff Frischman, for the record, um, I'm sorry, I don't have that information, but I'm going to defer to our chief economist. I believe he could probably shed some light on that, Dave Schmidt. Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. Uh, David Schmidt, for the record, uh, chief economist for Dieter. Uh, because of the relatively low overall numbers of uh, participation, uh, the the uh, volume isn't really there to have a really big impact on unemployment rates. Uh, we could certainly take a look, but I, I would expect that it would probably be pretty marginal in normal times, uh, trying to assess what impact it may have had during COVID. Uh, would be really challenging just because of everything else that was happening at that time. Uh, but I, I would expect because you have people who are working instead of being unemployed, uh, in all of our official measures, uh, that would count them as employed and not unemployed. And so it, it would reduce unemployment, but I don't think it would be to a, a significant degree. Okay, and I do have just... Um... Since I'm already asking my line of questions, I'm just going to keep going, and then I'll and then I'll move on to Assemblymember Duran. But um, now, will I will this just be grant money that federal grant money, or will there be an, an expectation on the small business side as well? Jeff Frischman, for the record, um, we would we would expect then anticipate that we could receive grant money in order to implement it, do the necessary program in our IT system. And um, from what we learned from Oregon was they had approximately one FTE or two, or was it three FTEs, I'm sorry, that were um, assigned to this particular program during the course, during normal times. So we're looking at about one and a half FTE, uh, roughly two FTEs that would probably need to be devoted to this uh, program um, and, and to the operation of the program. But the employers contribute. Um, as far as the employers contributing, um, th again, this is an opt-in program. No employers forced. It's, it's a choice. It's a tool in their toolbox. And I cannot think of where this is going to um, cost an employer more money, except for the fact that they will continue to be responsible to pay for the benefits 
of those employees that would be participating in this uh, program. For instance, if they were offering a pension, if they were offering compensation for um, health insurance, those types of things, they would choose to continue to pay those benefits while a claimant or an employee is, are in this program. Of course, they're gonna be making a business decision that if I have to lay this employee off for five months, would the cost of me retraining a new employee, bringing a new employee in the door in five months, because I know that um, my business is gonna go back up for whatever reason, or is it cheaper for me to pay or, or more economical for me to pay the benefits? Those are choices that the employer will be allowed to make. Um, and, and that would probably be the basis of them choosing to opt in or not. So as far as costs, no, there's really no additional cost. I'm just gonna jump back to my vice chair really quick who has a follow up in the same line of questions. And, and thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, so I might have misheard at the beginning, but this is a, a federal program that's sending dollars to the state to do this. Am I correct? Jeff Frischman, for the record, the, the dollars that are being sent, as I had stated earlier, were for the purposes of implementation, promotion, which means promotion to the employers to let them know that this is in their toolbox, and for improved administration. Those are what the federal dollars will fund. So the actual unemployment benefits will be funded through our current unemployment scheme, which means we would be drawing down more federal dollars, and the repayment of all of, all of that would be spread across all employers in the state. Is that correct? Jeff Richmond, for the record, I do not believe that's correct, that's totally correct. The, the dollars that would be coming in would, would affect the, the um, experience rating of the employer, and those dollars would be coming, you're right, it's coming from the trust fund, but the employers that have are laying folks off would be their experience rating would be affected. So the, the bigger, larger part of that burden would be placed on those particular employers. And if I may, Madam Chair, just because I want to get to the, the the very bottom of this. So, but currently in our system, the money that we've had to borrow from the federal government all employers in the state will be responsible. That'll end up on all of our tax bills as we pay our unemployment insurance premium tax to the state. So yes, the experience rating of those particular employers will change, but in the repayment of these dollars, will that be applied to all employers across the state who play, pay the unemployment insurance premium tax? Jeff Hirschman, for the record, I'm going to um, ask Dave Schmidt again to respond to that. He has a better understanding of the repayment and the trust fund. Thank you. Thank um, you. Uh, David Schmidt again, uh, Chief Economist for Dieter. Uh, I, I think you, you, you definitely have the, the broad strokes of it correct uh, because the benefits being paid out um, would, uh, the, 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 that obligation would have to be repaid, and uh, all employers will, will be participating, all contributory employers will be uh, participating uh, in the repayment uh, of those benefits. Uh, there would be a slightly higher burden uh, on any employer uh, who is participating in work share uh, instead of uh, keeping people employed. Uh, but uh, because the amount of benefits that are paid under work share are potentially less, um, uh, so it, it would cost them less to be in work share than to uh, fire a person potentially um, if they end up having uh, fewer benefits paid out overall. Uh, in addition, uh, because of one of the provisions in the bill, uh, which uh, states that employers who have a negative reserve ratio uh, cannot participate, uh, the, there, there's less opportunity for an employer who's already 
underwater and at the maximum rate, they can't participate in this. So only people who could potentially see, or only employers who could potentially see higher uh, contribution rates uh, would be eligible to participate. So there, there's no sort of way for them to, to escape uh, the charging of those benefits. And thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I'm, I'm sorry it took me a couple, but it's when we're doing this long distance, sometimes we don't really get our point across as well. And it's been a long day, so I may not be talking as clearly as I need to. But from what I, what I have heard is that in order to repay the trust fund, this will impact the trust fund. And those payments are spread across all employers that pay back, that will have, and we know they're going to have rate increases because we know we've been pulling money down from the trust fund. So it's a given that there's going to be a rate increase, but this will be applied across all employers is what I was hearing. Jeff Freshman, for the record, it may, maybe if I explain it this way, it may bring some more clarity. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to be as clear as I can. Um, if, as an example, if you have an employer who has two employees in this work share, to make it very simple, the, those both of each one of those employees earn five hundred dollars a week. Each one of those employees would have. For instance, $400 from unemployment insurance benefits that they would be entitled to per week. So if each one of their hours are cut to 20 hours a week or cut in half, they would earn from their job $250 from wages, and they would be entitled to half of what they would have uh, been entitled to for their unemployment insurance benefits, or what did I say, 400 a week? To, so they'd be entitled to 200 a week. So they would take home $450 each. Now, if you think about it, if they had laid, if the employer just laid off one employee, $400 would be coming out of the unemployment insurance trust fund anyway. And this way, there are two people drawing out of the unemployment insurance trust fund, but they're drawing $200 a piece, which of course equals the 400 Ms. anyway. Mr. Freshman, I'm going to encourage you to maybe um, chat offline with our vice chair because I don't think that's the, the an answer to a question that she asked. I think she was asking a different type of um, question, not in regards to the benefits received, but in regards to how many employers will help contribute to the repayment of the trust fund. So, But I am going to move on because we have other questions from the committee, and I would encourage you to maybe touch base with our vice chair offline. Okay, at this time, I'm going to move over to Assembly Member Duran. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for a person that has two jobs, because there's a lot of times that I know that they lay them off from one job and they can collect because they're, are, how is this going to affect them, that a person's laid off from one job and they have that, their employers, a, or he participates in that work share program, how does that affect him with his other position, if I make sense? Uh, this is uh, David Schmidt, uh, Chief Economist for Dieter. Uh, under Section 19 of the bill, uh, someone who has uh, multiple employers, uh, the, the, the general answer is uh, they uh, have their total reduction in hours considered, not just their reduction from the work-sharing employer, uh, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, if the total reduction across all of their jobs is less than 10%, uh, then they don't qualify for work-share uh, in sort of in accordance with the 10 to 60 uh, rule. Uh, and also, if their second employer, if they don't work at all for them, uh, then that employment is not considered and only their reduction in hours from the work-sharing employer is considered. But uh, for example, someone who uh, works uh, 40 hours a week, uh, let's say at two different jobs, uh, and has one of those uh, cut in half uh, to participate in work share, uh, their overall reduction in hours uh, would go from Eight, they, they would go from 80 hours to 60 hours. Uh, they have seen a 25% reduction. And so that's the uh, amount that would be applied to their work share. So they don't get uh, the whole 
uh, sort of credit for their, their hours just at the work share employer. It's uh, proportional to their total uh, combined hours. Thank you. And at this time, I'm going to come back. Assembly Member Tolls, did you want to ask your follow up? Thank you. That's a generous to come back. But earlier, I, 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 I failed to just clarify that when you talked about Oregon, that was 150 employers, correct, who had taken advantage of this before COVID and 2,000 employers during COVID. And I just uh, wanted to clarify that was correct. And then my second question would be then how many employees do we happen to have that number? So, you know, I mean, if it's 150 employers, are we talking maybe just a few employees at each of those, or are we talking thousands? Um, just wondering how, what the scope of impact was. Thanks. Jeff Frischman, for the record, we don't have the number of employees. However, Dave, uh, Mr. Schmidt has said that he could dig that up, so we can certainly provide that information for you. Thank you. And Mr. Frischman, if you would provide that to my committee manager so that she could, well, the committee manager, so that she could share it with the entire committee. Okay, members, I'm going to go to Assembly Member Dickman. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate the... Uh... Why do I always do this? Break my microphone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just have a quick question about how difficult is it to set up these work sharing plans or how complicated? And, and is this geared at geared to larger employ larger small businesses? Would it apply to a small business with say ten employees? Because I see I have to get the plan approved. Jeff Frischman, for the record, it's my understanding since we've never done it, so I can't answer it firsthand, but from what the other states have indicated to us, it's a relatively straightforward, relatively simple process, but I can't answer that firsthand because we've never done it. So would you have to set up this process, the application or the... Jeff Frischman, for the record, yes, we would establish, the administrator would establish what that process is. Um, we have gotten some um, indication from other states that they have some um, specialists who help walk through the, the, the employers to walk. They, they provide staff to help the employers walk through the application process. And I would anticipate that we would model our program um, along those lines. Thanks for that. And thank you, Chair. You are welcome, Assembly Member Dickman. Members at this time, do we have any other questions? Okay, now we can move on to the testimony. Oh, I'm oh, Assembly Member O'Neill, I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. Please, when you're ready. <laughs> I'm sort of hidden over here, Chair. I appreciate it, though. Thank you. I just got to ask, and it's really sort of a simple question because I think I like the bill. Matter of fact, I feel fairly certain I like the bill. But here's it, and I, it's a yes or no answer. If this bill became instituted in the state, are the projections then that will save money in our unemployment insurance in the programs and keep people partially working, at least partially working, and, and keep our unemployment rates down is the way I understand it. Is that a fair uh, understanding of the bill proposal? Jeff Freshman, for the record, yes. Like it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'm going to do a last call and do a double check. Okay, at this point, we will move on into testimony in support. I don't see anyone here in Carson City. I don't see anyone signed in on Zoom. So, BPS, if we could just check the telephone line. Testify in support of Senate Bill 308. Please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue.
Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Okay, I, we don't have anyone else with us in Carson City, so we can zip past that, and no one signed in on Zoom, so let's check the telephone line for opposition. To testify in opposition of Senate Bill 308, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. And let's go ahead and check neutral. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 308, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in the neutral position at this time. Thank you so much, BPS. Senator, would you like closing remarks? Uh, just thank you very much. I know it's been a long day, so I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Senator. And I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 308. Okay, members, that brings us to our last bill hearing for the day. Um, it is Senate Bill 289. I will open the hearing on Senate Bill 289, which revises provisions relating to workers' compensation. I know Senator Harris has instructed me that she will not be present for the bill presentation and said that the bill is in good hands with her friends Jason Mills and Erica Tosh, who I believe are with us on Zoom. I'm not sure who will be speaking first, but when you're ready, just unmute yourself and begin. And you're ready to begin. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This is Jason Mills from the Nevada Justice Association, and I've got together with me today Erica Tosh, also from the Nevada Justice Association. Uh, we worked closely with Senator Harris on this bill, as well as uh, the various stakeholders in the field, including our friends in organized labor, the Nevada Resort Association, the Nevada Self-Insured Association, and Employers Insurance Company of Nevada. Uh, Nevada Resort Association and Employers Insurance Company of Nevada both indicated that I could represent today that they are in support of this uh, bill as well as we move forward. Um, I would, in the interest of time, because I know it's just a long day here, I'm going to go through and, and explain, even though the bill has uh, various sections to it, the way LB, LCB has drafted it because it touches so many different areas of law. Uh, it causes the uh, the sections to jump around a little bit, but the issues are the same. So I'm going to address them by issues and then reference the sections if that would help. Um, first and uh, foremost is that sections one and seven are dealing with what's called the apportionment of PPDs and forced installments. PPDs are permanent partial disability awards at the end of cases. Current case law basically says that uh, if you had a prior injury or a prior award uh, for a rating, that the, if the same body part was implicated, then the award would be apportioned or reduced. That is existing law. And what we're looking to do with sections one and seven is to further clarify exactly how apportionment should be done. Uh, specifically that the apportionment should be done just through uh, prior PPDs or if there's existing medical records that would show that a person had an actual impairment prior to the injury. Um, finally, if there were no medical records that were available, there will be a section, there's a section in the, uh, in the bill that's namely sections one, uh, pages four, five, and six, that indicate that um, evidence of a prior surgery would allow for apportionment. The next section uh, or issue to be addressed is found in sections two, four, six, and 10. And that's at pages eight, 10, 12, 13, 15, 16, 17, 24, and 25. And that has to do with the proof of service of determinations by insurers on claimants. What it would do is, if requested, would require an insurer, when they issue one of their determinations to a claimant, that they would have to uh, send it either by fax or through other electronic transmission with the proof of sending and receipt that is readily verifiable. This is to address the issue of uh, 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 
uh, determinations that sometimes are questioned whether or not they've actually been served on the parties. And this is to address that particular issue. And all it does, if there is no proof of service, is it simply tolls the, the, the statute until the parties have acknowledged their receipt or are able to prove the receipt that they did uh, deliver it. The, the next issue uh, uh, to be addressed is in Section 3. That introduces lien language into the Industrial Insurance Act uh, that is essentially in complement to SB 33 from the 2019 session uh, to essentially carry out the intent of the 2019 session to allow the lien language that was created there to also exist inside of the act and therefore be um, uh, internally consistent. The, the next section is section five that's found at page 15. Uh, that is with regard to the recoverable costs that uh, can be incurred in the workers' compensation claim. Currently, there are there is no mechanism for an injured worker to recover any costs from uh, from the um, from having to fight or defend an industrial insurance claim. Particularly, this cost section would allow for the recovery if they are successful on a litigated matter, such as deposition costs, clerk of court costs expert witness costs, postage and copies and travel to those deposition costs. It would only apply to the costs that were generated as a matter from the issue that were actually litigated. So it's not the cost of the entire claim, but only those issues that uh, incur costs that are actually litigated. It would then be supplied to the insurer. So the insurer has a, the right to review it. And then if the parties don't agree on those costs, then the, the appeals officer would then uh, adjudicate that. The, uh, the next issue has to do with the effect of signing lump sum or your award payments, what we call PPD awards, uh, and the implication of what that does to your claim. That's found in section eight, uh, and that's at pages 22 and 23. Currently, the law uh, says that when a claimant signs those election papers and workers' compensation awards, it extinguishes all issues that are pending on the case, except for their, their right to reopen, except for vocational rehabilitation benefits, and except for penalties that the Division of Industrial Relations has levied. This uh, uh, section would make an amendment that if there is any pending contested matter at the time of signing the, uh, the PPD or the award documents, then those two are preserved uh, ex and the, the exception would be the scope of claim could no longer be fought over, uh, whether or not the claimant was stable and rateable could no longer be fought over, and the average monthly wage could no longer be fought over. However, such issues like out-of-pocket expenses that are often left hanging at the time when the award needs to be signed by the claimant, if they are in pending litigation, then they would be able to continue on that issue. Or, for example, retroactive benefits that were still owed that they would otherwise lose if they signed the award, even though the parties already agree that what the award is. I think it's important to point out that the intent and uh, meaning of the phrase uh, that has to do with when any contested matter is pending at the time of the signing of the PPD documents means essentially anything that's been filed in front of the hearing office, the appeals office, the district court, uh, the court of appeals, the Supreme Court, or any other court of competent jurisdiction. Those are the five sections of the, or the five issues that, uh, that I'm addressing today. And my uh, colleague, uh, Ms. Tosh, will address the other three issues uh, it, that are in this bill. Ms. Tosh. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and the committee for allowing us to speak today. I am Erica Tosh, um, E-R-I-C-A, last name T-O-S-H, on behalf of NJA. Um, I'll be discussing those sections that have not already been covered by my colleague here. Um, specifically under SB 289, um, the addition of nurse practitioners and physician's assistants have been added as medical professionals who will be able to provide initial treatment and examinations to industrial, claim, industrial claimants. It allows the nurse practitioners and the physician assistants to also complete C4 forms, which are a necessary requirement for an injured worker to initiate a worker's compensation claim. These um, provider, medical providers can also be required to testify, have their opinion now considered and relied upon by appeals officers and hearing officers and the parties. 
they can be held to the same standards for filing as the physicians who are currently treating injured workers. Further, by having nurse practitioners and physician assistants assist in helping injured workers, they're able to obtain medical attention more quickly in rural areas in Nevada where medical doctors are often not readily accessible as they are in urban areas. The language dealing with the nurse practitioners and the physician's assistants kind of spread out throughout the bill, um, but you can most readily find it under subsections contained in section one, two, three, four, six, and nine of the bill. Next, um, dealing with sections two, four, six, and 10, this bill will allow for electronic transmission of determinations, medical signatures, and the providing of proof of service by electronic means should a claimant or a person acting on behalf of the claimant choose this method of service. This section goes both to the expediency and the ease of delivery of documents in an industrial claim and allows for timely filing of appeals as needed. In addition, proof of service by electronic means must be maintained and made readily available when requested. Lastly, section nine pertains to the vocational rehabilitation counselors and the selection process that we use for those counselors. Last legislative session, AB 128 passed, allowing claimants to choose between three vocational rehabilitation counselors um, when they were eligible for those benefits. What occurred after the passage of AB 128 was that the insurers or third party administrators would provide three counselors from the same company, thereby in essence eliminating the choice aspect for the claimant. Section nine of SB 289 is, is intended to rectify that situation by requiring that three counselors be from different entities or companies, um, thus reinstating the choice that was intended originally under AB 128. In short, these sections here will provide additional medical professionals that can be available to claimants in industrial claims. It modernizes the service of documents and it clarifies requirements for vocational rehabilitation counselor assignments. With that, I'll pass the floor back to my colleague, Mr. Mills. Madam Chair, that concludes our presentation. We know that uh, we wanted to leave as much time as possible for any questions that you or any of the members of the committee may have, and we're available for any of your questions. Thank you so much. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, Mr. Mills and Ms. Tosh, I am gonna turn it over to the committee members for questions and start with my vice chair. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Hello, Mr. Mills. It's very nice to see you again, even though it's remotely. Um, so in all my years in this building doing workers' comp bills, um, thank you for having such a concise presentation. And it, it's my impression with talking with the folks that were involved in this particular bill, which is always really great for workers' comp, is there were a lot of people at the table and this was a very highly negotiated bill and everyone found a way to get where they needed to be to address the issues that are in this bill. Am I correct? Madam Vice Chair Jason Mills for Nevada Justice. Yes, that's correct. We spoke with all of the major stakeholders, like I said, including the Nevada Resort Association, uh, Nevada Self-Insured, Employers Insurance Company of Nevada. In fact, much of this bill contained uh, language from a bill that Nevada Self-Insured Association had uh, pending under SB 266, and we incorporated much of the language from their bill into this bill, uh, which is how we were able to uh, achieve such wide consensus on, on this uh, on this matter, Madam Vice Chair. And, and thank you very much, um, Madam Chair and, and, and Mr. Mills. It, it, it's always good when the opposition stuff is in your bill too, so that way you both have just as much to lose. So thank you very much for all of your hard work on this. I think this will, will benefit the folks that you're trying to take care of. The goal in the state has always been to get injured workers back to work. That's our, our, our main goal. But we know if that doesn't happen, there's a lot of other things that need to work through the system in order to take care of that injured worker. So thank you very much. Thank you. Vice Chair, I'm going to go to Assembly Member Flores. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you for that presentation. And I think you did a great job walking us through that. I think it'd be great for the committee and, and for the record to understand some of the, I guess some of those really bad practices that are out there and how some members in Nevada are disproportionately impacted when we're talking about workers' compensation, say when we're comparing uh, uh, an injured employee from our rurals versus maybe uh, Las Vegas or Reno. 
Um, and, and I asked that specifically, that lead-up question, or better said, I, I lay that foundation so we can talk a little bit about nurses, the, the inserting the language of nurses and PAs. My understanding is that um, at times there's paperwork that's completed by nurses and PAs and then later results in, in, in those claims being denied because the MDs didn't um, sign off on those. And obviously that's a, there's a whole host of issues behind that. But I think if you could provide some context as to that and, and, and just really uh, explain to folk what's happening out there, I, I think they'll see why this is so important. Thank you, Assembly um, Min Flores. Just to address a few of those issues, um, what we see on a pretty regular basis is that um, individuals seek out medical attention quickly after an injury. However, there may not be the medical providers available to them in the rural areas, and therefore there's a delay in getting that type of C4 or document we need to initiate a claim. Providing nurse practitioners and providing physicians assistance in those areas, which are are more readily available will allow injured workers to get the necessary documents they need to pursue their claim and ideally get treatment um, a lot quicker than they, they often are. Here in, in urban areas, we have general facilities like in Central Medical Center, which is pretty readily available for people to seek medical attention and they offer 24 hour care. Um, but you don't see that in other areas of the state. And so the bill was designed in order to accommodate those areas that are underserved um, so that injured workers can reap the benefits of getting the attention they need when they're injured on the job. Thank you for that. And I, I appreciate you putting that language in there. I had an opportunity to reach out to a bunch of folk ahead of this hearing and um, they were just very appreciative. So I wanted to put that on the record for all that work you've put in. Thank you. Members, any other questions for our presenters? Okay, seeing none, we can go ahead and move into testimony in support. Is there anyone on Zoom wishing to testify in support? Broadcasting, could you check the telephone lines for us? Yes, Chair. To testify in support of Senate Bill 289, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 477, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and I begin. Caller with the last three digits of 477, please press star six to unmute. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the committee, Bob Ostrowski for the record, O-S-D-R-O-V-S-K-Y, today we're representing the Nevada Resort Association and Employers Insurance Company, the, uh, the legacy company that uh, was developed from the old state industrial insurance system. I would just like to thank um, the members of both the NJA, Jason Mills in particular, and um, the Nevada Self-Insured Employers Association, uh, who worked our way through many issues in this bill. We think we've reached a very good balance uh, and brought clarity to a number of areas in the law which will assist employees um, and allow employers and their administrators a reasonable opportunity um, <clears throat> to bring forward their cases at the same time. Uh, we think this is a very balanced bill, and we wholeheartedly support it and ask for the committee's support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Broadcasting, next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 222. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 222, two, two. please press star six to unmute. I apologize, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I missed the star. Again, my name is Sarah Adler, S-A-R-A-H-A-D-L-E-R, with Silver State Government Relations. Today, proud to be representing the Nevada Advanced Practice Nurses Association. 
Evaluations required for assessing injured workers are within the scope of practice of nurse practitioners. As Ms. Tosh has detailed, SB 289 recognizes the full practice authority, accountability, and competence of APRNs. As Assemblyman Flores just pointed out, APRNs are fully trained in completing the C4 claims and other responsibilities. Uh, the passage of SB 289 will streamline delivery of medical care to injured workers, and uh, NAPNA appreciates Senator Harris bringing this forward. Thank you for your testimony. Broadcasting next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this Thank you. We can now check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in opposition. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 289, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 835. Please slowly stay and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and maybe. Caller with the last three digits of 835, please press star six to unmute. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is, uh, my name is Dalton Hooks. Uh, I apologize, I did not get in the queue under support. I'm, <laughs> I'm calling in support of this bill on behalf of the Nevada Self-Insurers Association. Um, and um, <clears throat> we want to thank uh, Mr. Mills, as well as the other stakeholders and their work in getting this very, very important bill together. I apologize for being under the opposition call, having some phone problems here. It is quite all right. We will move you into the support testimony portion. No worries. Broadcasting thank next you very much. You're very <laughs> welcome. Broadcasting next caller, please. There, there are no more callers in the opposition at this time. Okay, let's go ahead and check the telephone line for those in neutral. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 289, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you so much. Um, presenters, would you like to give any closing remarks? Uh, I would just like to, Jason Mills, Nevada Justice Association. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to say thanks to uh, Senator Harris for bringing uh, together this uh, much needed uh, legislation. I would like to thank this uh, committee and uh, yourself, the chair, and the other members of the committee for taking this bill under consideration and ask for your support. I would also like to thank the stakeholders that we work with, Nevada Resort Association, um, Nevada Self-Insured Association, uh, the, the Employers Insurance Company of Nevada, and other stakeholders. We, we really appreciate them. And if, and if I may, Madam Chair, uh, address um, Madam Vice Chair Carlton and say that I truly have enjoyed uh, working with you, uh, Madam Vice Chair, over the years and appearing before you on these issues of workers' compensation. Um, your dedication and understanding of these topics has always been refreshing to me. And I just wanted to say uh, you're going to be missed. I think there's many of us who share that sentiment. And thank you very much, Mr. Mills. I, I think I might need the definition of refreshing, but I'll let the committee decide that. Thank you very much. Thank you, and committee members, with that, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 289. Okay, thank you, members. I know this has been a long day for many of us, but we do have one item left on our agenda, which is public comment. And while we give those time to who are listening over the internet time to call in, I will go through quick public comment housekeeping. I wanna remind everyone that we only take public comment that falls within the jurisdiction of the Commerce and Labor Committee. If your remarks, the remarks that you are giving are outside of our 
committee purview, then we will ask you to redirect them or terminate them. We open and close bill testimony so that we establish a public record on it. So public comment is not intended to be a continuation of a bill hearing. I would remind everyone to please be respectful while providing public comment, and you can always submit your public comment as written remarks to our committee manager for inclusion in the record. With that, um, broadcasting, is there anyone in queue for public comment? To take your place in public comment, please press star nine now to join the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. There are no callers in the queue for public comment at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, any other comments from committee members before we adjourn? Okay, at this time, I do want to wish all of our mothers on the committee and all of our mothers who are committee staff um, a very happy Mother's Day this weekend. Please go home and enjoy a wonderful time with your family and happy Mother's Day. We are adjourned. <laughs>